Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors. This is episode 176 and the ninth instalment of all things 16th century women. I'm your host, Natalie Grinegar. Thank you so much for joining me today. Throughout August and September, we've been exploring the lives of 16th century women through a series of podcast episodes here on Talking Tudors and video lectures over on my YouTube channel. While all the content is free, I ask that you consider supporting the event by becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll have access to patron only monthly giveaways. September's prize is a one-year subscription to Tudor Places magazine. You can find out more about them at TudorPlaces.com. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTudors. And if you're interested in the life and times of Queen Anne Boleyn, the 12-month course I'm running next year, 365 Days with Anne Boleyn, closes at the end of this month. So if you've been thinking about joining us, if you've been thinking about enrolling, I ask you to head to my website for details, www.onthetutortrail.com, or just Google search 365 Days with Anne Boleyn. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about the dress worn by Tudor women is Dr. Owen Emerson. Dr. Emerson is a social and cultural historian, currently working as castle historian and assistant curator at the stunning Hever Castle in Kent, Anne Boleyn's childhood home. He completed his doctoral research at the University of Sussex. Owen's first book, co-authored with the historian Claire Ridgway, is entitled The Boleyns of Hever Castle. His second book, co-authored with the historian Kate McCaffrey, is entitled Becoming Anne, Connections, Culture, Court. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Welcome to 16th Century Women, Owen. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Thank you, Natalie. I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. And I've lured you back to my podcast again. I'm I'm getting really good at this, I think. (laughs) It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Owen, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Okay. Um, So my name is Dr. Owen Emerson. I'm a social and cultural historian. I completed my doctoral research at the University of Sussex. 
I'm the co-author of two books. I wrote The Berlins of Heber Castle with Claire Ridgway and Becoming Anne Connections Culture Court with historian Kate McCaffrey. I've been in a few TV documentaries, including The Berlins, A Scandalous Family, and I have the absolute pleasure of being the castle historian and assistant curator at the idyllic Heaver Castle Anne Boleyn's childhood home. Fantastic. And I have had the pleasure of uh, reading your books and they are excellent. So everyone go and check out those books that Owen just mentioned. Now, we're going to be talking about something that we both love. So due to, due to clothing. Yes. So let's jump in. What began your fascination with the clothing of the 16th century? Do you know, I think actually my love of studying 16th century clothing began when perhaps a lot of other people's fascination began. Watching elaborate and often highly problematic Tudor costumes in films. And one of the earliest films I remember seeing was Anne of the Thousand Days. And Margaret Furs, the great Hollywood costume designer, I think deservedly won an Oscar for her work on that film. She also did the costuming for the 1971 film Mary Queen of Scots, which again has some beautifully created and crafted costumes. And to be honest, I had a childhood spent watching as many Tudor films and television dramas as I possibly could. And I think this really piqued a lifelong interest in Tudor clothing. And I think as my understanding of how inaccurate all of these filmic portrayals of Tudor England really are, so too did my understanding of how detached these costumes, and they very much are costumes, are from the clothes worn by the people in these dramas um, that they depict. These really are costumes, and at best, they give us a flavour, a silhouette of uh, the kinds of garments that early modern women wore. At worst, they are completely anachronistic and give us absolutely no <laughs> idea whatsoever as to what these women wore. I must add here that this is not my area of expertise, but it has been an area that I have very much enjoyed studying and it has become something of a passion and particularly so since I started working at the lovely Heaver Castle. Working at a historic site, I have the absolute pleasure of working alongside people who create and wear uh, recreated clothing from the Tudor era, and I've learned so much from them. I'm often having very long conversations with them about how they've done the research to uh, create these garments. And I absolutely love watching them getting ready, seeing all the layers. And yeah, I've had, to, I've had some really enriching conversations that have led me to go down rabbit holes with inventories and things like that. So that's one aspect of, of where this love comes from. But another reason I think that my fascination of this topic has grown is because I work with one of the best collection of 16th century portraits in a private collection outside of the National Portrait Gallery. Heaver holds a really exceptional collection of contemporary portraiture and assisting our wonderful curator, Alison Palmer, with the care of these really fascinating artefacts. My love of, of Tudor clothing has only grown. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, a combination of many things. But it's important, I, I think, to realise that the individuals depicted in the portraits at Heaver are more than likely not, you know, wearing sumptuous cloth of gold and not the, the, the homespun uh, clothing that uh, many of the working people who used to occupy that castle would have worn. Visually at Heaver, we only really have the upper classes represented. They are, the working classes are visually completely absent from the pictorial narrative that we have amassed at that place. Um, so yes, finding those other Tudor women is something of a, a passion of mine as well. Absolutely. And we're, we're in this series, we're talking about 
not just Tudor women, but 16th century women. And and I want to know, why do you think it's actually important that we understand and we know how women during this time were dressed? What does that, what does that tell us and, or teach us? I think it really matters because I think clothes tell us how women related to their surroundings. They tell us the kind of activities that women were and were not doing And they tell us about the constraints put upon them by society, by men. For example, the headgear that women wore in the 16th century can actually be be seen by many people today as desirable. There's a whole industry recreating French hoods, for example, and particularly in light of filmic representations. There's been a recent trend, I don't know if you've seen it recently, of women wearing small padded headbands which the fashion industry has explicitly linked to recent depictions of Anne Boleyn and incidentally the same thing happened in the early 1970s after Anne of the Thousand Days had aired in cinemas and I find this fascinating because on the one hand these head garments are being replicated in a modern twist in a modern style today at the same time that debates are still raging about whether women today should be compelled to cover their hair. And of course, in the 16th century, women were compelled to cover their hair. So I think actually studying women's clothing and the the constraints on their lives takes us right to the heart of social, political and religious conventions. And of course, the restrictions that came with those conventions. But I also think it helps us to get at continuity and change. One of the things that I heard most recently on your brilliant podcast with two absolute heroes of mine, Dr. Jane Malcolm Davies and Nina Michaelia, talking about how individuality is seen as desired in today's society. And that really wasn't a feature of early modern culture. This is something I've really hadn't considered before. And that really struck me um, that it was far more desirable in the 16th century for women to wear garments entirely expected of one's social standing. Now, this was sort of revolutionary in terms of thinking for me, because whilst I think we do like and are encouraged to see ourselves as similar to our historical counterparts from the 16th century, we are also remarkably different to them. At the same time, there is this tension between the present and the past. And I think that tension really, really matters. It matters that we understand where we are similar and where society has changed. And then we get to ask ourselves that really important and really difficult question, of why we have changed. Yeah, such a fantastic answer. And I'm so glad you brought up that interview with um, Jane and Nina because it was just, oh. it was so enlightening. And I came away from that thinking a lot of new things too. And that struck me as well that, of course, yeah, now we want to be unique, individual, express ourselves. But of course, then you really wanted to fit in with your, as you've said, with your your status. So it was like a real eye opener. You know, it's so it seems so obvious, but I hadn't really considered it. So it's fascinating, isn't it? Such a light bulb moment. And, you know, when I look at my amazing nieces today, they are forming their own identities and they are expressing that increasingly as they're beginning to earn money and purchase their own clothes. They are developing their own styles. And do you know what? It might not be particularly detached from their their friendship group, but that again tells us about codes. It tells us about belonging and it tells us about, you know, agency, doesn't it? So actually it is quite difficult to invert that thinking and map it back on to the opposite being about having some kind of agency and fitting in and um, telling people about your social status and telling people about your wife's social status. So it's a very different way of thinking and it, it does require us to detach ourselves, I think, somewhat. 
Yeah, that's so true because you you sort of think by dressing the same, you're giving away your power. But in fact, no, by having a perfectly ironed, you know, linen piece on you, you're you're showing something, aren't you? And it's you're you're showing your power. So it's really interesting. All right. So if we think about ordinary people, you know, we often obviously see in these amazing portraits that you get to very, very lucky, you get to look at these, you know, almost daily. Um, We see a certain way of dress. But then we have other people, the ordinary people that are dressing differently. So how do we how do we get at this? How do we study it? And and what are ordinary sort of people wearing in the Tudor era? Well, like you say, um, and as I said earlier, I love to study portraits because of what they can tell us about clothing. But for working people, portraiture is far less helpful than it is for uh, studying the aristocracy, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, that isn't to say that there are no portraits of working class people in this period. There absolutely are. Um, But they tend to be images of working people in much larger compositions. There tend to be a lot of working people in these compositions. And therefore, they tend to be smaller and they tend to be less detailed. It's also true that working people are much more ubiquitously depicted in the burgeoning print media. And of course... We don't have those crucial close-up studies in oil of working people because they simply could not afford to employ a talented artist to recreate the likeness of their nearest and dearest as much as I'm sure they would have loved to. So we don't have that access um, that we would for upper-class persons. We do have many portraits of the merchant class and above, but can comparatively few painted images of working people. So we necessarily don't get that detail, as I say, of the clothing that working people are wearing in comparatively small depictions and in a woodcut print, as we do in in an oil painting. Then we have the difficulty of the fact that clothes were incredibly expensive commodities, regardless of your social standing. And also there was a necessary sort of temporary feature of clothing uh, in that they would often be repaired, they would often be cut and reused uh, to ensure the longest possible life. Uh, it's like uh, likely that, as with later generations, and my nan still does this, that once garments had passed a stage where they could be worn, they would have been, again, cut up and used as household rags. Um, So there's a a necessary death for some of these items as well, which does not help in terms of us getting access to remaining garments. So I think this gives us something of an indication of why only partial, rare, expensive and elaborate garments from the aristocracy tend to survive when comparatively few garments from working people do. Now, that's not to say that they don't survive um, because uh, the work of the team at the Tudor Taylor have created an amazing database of, I think it's something like 55,000 garments of, you know, working fragments, working class fragments and inventories and things that literally, you know, give us access. And this isn't just from England. This is uh, from other countries as well. I have yet to trawl through it, um, but I cannot wait. Now, we can glimpse um, from household accounts, wills, inventories, from uh, uh, what sort of materials were afforded to working people in people's households. And these are brilliant sources, for example, of, uh, if you want to discover what kinds of liveries and items of clothing were being worn by, worn by the servant class at court. We do have very good details often uh, in court records. Now, as to like what type of clothing working people would be wearing, um, wool was you know a material that spans the classes really and but which is a staple of working class clothing these materials would have been simply woven they very likely would have been preserved in the natural colors that's what a lot of um the uh, tudor taylor research suggests and quite often they would have been homespun so created at home indeed many many working people would have been deeply involved in the wool and cloth 
industry as it was one of the prime commodities that was consumed and exported uh, during the 16th century from England. So we've mentioned that natural colours would have been the norm for working people. There is also the fact that red was a ubiquitous colour for women to wear, again, across the social classes. And there would have been a difference, shall we say, in the appearance of the kind of dyes that would have been afforded to working people. Coifs and headdresses, again, spanned the classes and um, particularly undergarments would have been fashioned from, from linens. And I really am desperate to get my ha- hands on the typical Tudor book that's coming out. I This is one of the books that I have been most looking forward to. Um, I think it's been delayed a couple of times. I might be wrong. But the research that, that Dr. Jane Malcolm Davies and Nina Michaelia are doing is wonderful. And I also very recently saw that they are undertaking a conference i think it's as a part of the launch of the the book and i'm missing very person, very tempted I think it's called missing yes person. and yeah. it's, it's taking place in a courtroom and um i i yeah i'm really very excited about the prospect of attending because they are heroes of mine i don't know if any of you have visited the etsy page but I, for some reason, it's one. It's on my like almost weekly sort of like check up to see what's what's been uploaded or what's on there. Honestly, some of the things like obviously they have created many. They they have published many books with patterns in. But they do also sell separate patterns and the most exquisite recreations of things like ouches and pearls and I spend far too long of my time sort of hoping to put things in my basket that I can't possibly uh, justify doing so please do visit their Etsy page do invest in their forthcoming and previous publications because they are such an invaluable and um, scholarly window into this subject I, I can't recommend them highly enough And they are such lovely people. On top of everything else, they are just so amazing to speak to, so generous. They're so lovely. And and I pre-ordered their book as soon as I could pre-order it. And I think the latest update is October from the last thing I heard. But I will wait, oh, and I'm waiting patiently because I want that book. (laughs) And I should also mention, because you mentioned patterns, However, yes. you do not need to be creating, you know, clothing in order to get something from these books. I don't sew. I wish I did. I need to be more like a Tudor woman, but um, I don't sew. But they are still so valuable just for the information. Oh, my God, yeah. The visuals. I'm a very, yes. you know, I, I like visuals. I need to see things. And and they're just brilliant, aren't they? I totally agree. Totally agree with you. They're going to love this episode that we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bit of promotion. Um, yeah. Come on. We love Deservedly them. so. Absolutely. So tell, can you tell me a little bit more about the actual differences? I suppose you have already mentioned some things, but the differences in what the upper classes are wearing and what the lower classes are wearing. You've talked about the fact that obviously materials, you know, the lower classes are generally wearing homegrown wool. The dyes are different. The colours are different. It's fairly evident from the much more plentiful visual records that there are significant differences um, between the more functionary clothes chiefly wool that are worn by the the working classes to the kinds of clothes were worn at the top of society. Now, as you've just mentioned, that wool was ubiquitous material that transcended the classes. However, the upper classes um, would have worn the finest, the softest kind of wool, knitted very finely and closely. Um, So we can say that they are similar, but these are leagues apart in terms of what they feel like, what they look like. So the, the raw material might be the same, but it's, a, it's about the effort, isn't it? It's about the process that has gone into conditioning and presenting these fabrics. Like working women, a chemise or a shift uh, would have been created from linen, but the finest of linen. And this would have been elaborately decorated with black or red work, uh, a very particular kind of stitching that actually upper-class women would sit and do. This was kind of a part of labour that they lavished upon uh, in their time. Now, these embroidered parts of um, the chemise or shift would be visible around the neckline and the cuffs. Cottons, for example, were usually the preserve of the upper classes. And we can often obviously see 
the finest of silks, brocades, and these would be embellished with really astonishing precious jewels, ouches, ribbons, and lace. It's really about quantity and quality um, with upper class attire. And also it's an attention to the layered nature of garments. Now we were talking earlier about that brilliant point about the lack of individuality and the desirability of being able to distinguish social class um, through clothing. And this was heavily enacted in sumptuary laws in this era, laws which govern the kinds of material, furs, and colours that you could wear at court. So these were literally dictated to the court. If you caught a glimpse of someone in blue at Henry's court, they were, chances are they were working in a specific kind of livery. If you saw someone in purple or cloth of gold, you would know that you were in the presence of royalty. If you saw someone in ermine, for example, you would expect them or know them to be stationed as or married to someone of or above the position of the esquire of the body in the royal household. So this is all coded. You know, these um, furs, these fabrics are telling you something. They are a language that perhaps we don't enjoy today. Now, rich women could expect their gowns and other garments to be lined with silks or indeed furs to add warmth. One of my most favourite sources, I don't know why, but I find it really touching, is the detail that Thomas Boleyn has delivered hogsheads of a particular kind of wine that Margaret Butler, his mother, loves to Heva. And he's also forked out to have her gowns furred for the winter. There's something really touching in the fact that he has thought about her from another place sent her her favourite wine and has ensured that her gowns are furred. And we know that she's staying at Heaver. Trust me, Heaver in the winter can be really quite cold. And this is, this is one of the ways that women would protect themselves from the cold uh, if they had the luxury of having the funds to do so. Literally lining their, the gown, the outer garment with fur. We can see this very clearly in that beloved portrait of mine, believed to have been painted by Master John of Catherine Parr, you can very clearly see the fur beneath her outer gown. Now I need to I need to go and look at that portrait again, Owen, because you, you've mentioned it a few times, and I just want to study it in detail. I want to just zoom in and have a look. So I you know, you and it. I spend a lot of time with Anne Boleyn. We study her life and a lot of research into her. So you've probably come across this because I certainly have. People claim that she was a, a sort of pioneer when it comes to certain fashions. And let's just think about, for example, the French hood. So many people yeah. have often said and introduced the French hood to England. And we've also heard things like certain sleeves and a certain style of sleeves that she introduced. So is there any truth to this? I love it. It's whenever I put post a portrait purporting to be Anne Boleyn, and especially when I post a picture of the only known likeness of her or substantial one, the Most Happy Medal from 1534, uh, which depicts Anne in a, a bonnet in front lit and English gable hood, you can, you can be guaranteed that's not Anne Boleyn, that's Jane Seymour, simply because of the, the, the headgear that she is wearing. And this is an area that absolutely fascinates me and one which I have spent a lot of time looking into. Yet we are often told that because Anne spent time in France, uh, she was the pioneer who brought the French hood to the English court. Now, of course... It's easy to see why, uh, because the most ubiquitous and recognisable portrait model of Anne Boleyn shows her in a black French gown, embellished with gold ouches and pearls, and her head is covered with a French hood. And that French hood is similarly adorned with pearls on the inner and outer bilimens. Now, actually, if we look at Anne Boleyn's financial records, we can find evidence that Anne was indeed purchasing bilaments for French hoods, but we can also quite clearly see her investing in what was then termed a bonnet and a frontlet, which was the term we now sort of ignore and we call it an English gable hood because of its gable-like presence uh, or appearance. So while we can say that Anne did indeed wear French hoods, she also absolutely wore 
the English fashion. And moreover, I would like to complicate this whole notion of what a French hood actually is, because I think it's far, far more complex than it first appears to be. So just like English gable hood being a modern term, um, so too is actually the French hood especially is there is a clear evolution in England and in Scotland uh, that there is a direct development from the pipe hood, uh, which is seen in the 14th and 15th century, through to the open hoods of the, the later 15th century, to what we now would see as a French hood. These are the same garment, essentially. They have just evolved differently, and they have evolved here as well as on the continent. Why I think there's a propensity to call it the French hood is because while the English gable hood became popular at the English court, uh, the French hood became more ubiquitous in France. So there's much, much evidence to say that what we would term the French hood in England has a much, much longer history. Indeed, this is this is evidenced with Catherine of Aragon's account. We know that she is wearing um, this softer hood. And we also know that the Dowager Queen of France, Mary Tudor Brandon, also is depicted wearing them long before Anne Boleyn is on the scene. And I would argue they were in existence for centuries before. This is an evolution of uh, that very medieval pipe hood that is, to all intents and purposes, still in place with the French hood. One of the things that I love doing most is scouring historical records to try and get a better understanding of where these tropes emerge from. And one of the things that really struck me in filmic representations of Anne Boleyn was the propensity to show her in not just the ubiquitous black gown that we most readily see her in in portraits, but also the um, the colour green and I just had this burning desire to trawl through as many possible accounts as I possibly could and to try and see where this notion had come from. Did it have any foundation in the historical record or was it simply just a, an anachronistic attribute applied because of that theory that green sleeves have been <laughs> written for Anne Boleyn by Henry Dates when we know it's an Elizabethan ballad. So actually Looking through Henry Dates' accounts between 1530 and 1531, and his expenditure on Anne jumped from £220 to £330 per annum. That's roughly in uh, British pounds, £146,000 in today's money. Quite an exorbitant fee. I saw that Henry had purchased Anne a gown in green damask. In 1535, he gave Anne more than 20 yards of green silk satin and over 30 yards of green cloth of gold. So I think there's a pattern forming here. And from the expenditure that Anne made in her final months as queen, we can see that she decorated chairs in her apartments in green silk. She had a bed decorated in green satin and she also ordered 32 and three quarter yards of green buckram to line the presses in her cupboards for her apartment. She also extended this green trend into Elizabeth's wardrobe too, also uh, ordering Elizabeth a green kirtle of satin uh, in 1536. It's one of the last things that Anne ordered for Elizabeth. And one of my most favourite finds was in the in inventories taken at Henry's death. And this find was located at Hampton Court in 1548. And I think it's worth quoting at length because it was, and I quote, carpet of gold, silver and silk needlework with roses of red and white and Queen Anne's ciphers with a border about the same of honeysuckles, acorns, H and A of like needlework fringed at both ends with a deep fringe and at both sides with a narrow fringe of Venice gold silver and silk lined with green damask being in length three yards and in breadth two scant. Now I just love how detailed this one particular item, uh, this carpet that had once belonged to Henry and Anne and I love the fact that Anne and Henry's personal emblems are detailed on this particular carpet. 
And I love the fact that this really sort of gets to the heart of challenging this narrative that Henry obliterated all traces of Anne after she fell. Actually, there are loads of Anne's <laughs> items and belongings remaining in Henry's inventories, including initialed necklaces and jewellery. So I do think, you know, actually scouring these records can not only help us to unpick um, sort of these tropes from popular culture, but they can also help us start to challenge some of the narratives given in academia too. Yeah, I love that description of that carpet. It's just, and, and yes. like you, I love that it has their private motif on there. It's this, you know, it takes you back, doesn't it, to a time where their relationship was still obviously working to a point. Totally. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. magnificent. And I, I love looking through the inventories as well. It's just fantastic. So, Owen, love in terms it. of using portraiture as a source to better understand the clothing and to kind of get an insight into what people are wearing, what are some of the challenges associated with that? So this is a really important question, um, one which I am continually exploring. I think portraits tell us so much and it's easy to try and see them as our best source for what clothing looked like, how it was constructed, but it is not an unproblematic source base. Now, one of the most important considerations I think to make when analysing early modern portraits is that many of them were produced in studios from patterns created by other artists. So, for example, if we look at the portraiture of Queen Elizabeth I, there was a typical authorised facial pattern created by a specific artist. And that pattern will be re reproduced by other artists or associate artists within that artist's studio. So the vast majority of these portraits weren't created from life. But we do also have to consider that the artist therefore isn't observing things like clothing. Now, we do have some evidence that specific garments could be loaned for specific portraits. But again, we do have to consider that actually none of this may have been observed by the artist. And the only thing that they may have seen is evidence gleaned from a preparatory sketch or a pattern created from that preparatory sketch. So a good number of 16th century portraits are essentially copies that were made at the time, corridor portraits that were commissioned for the households of wealthy individuals to show allegiance to the king or queen by re reproducing their likeness and also the likenesses of their ancestors to hang in their long galleries or corridors. Now, some of these portraits, don't get me wrong, are very, very faithful copies, whereas some are cruder, they don't necessarily show the same amount of detail that can be found in the original portraits. And I think this can give us a skewed uh, view of the clothes that the individuals were originally wearing or shown wearing. There are a number, for example, of corridor portraits labelled as Anne Boleyn, which have very awkward details in the clothing that really don't make physical sense where pearls are shown to be disappearing into areas that they physically could not uh, disappear into or were certainly or even floating in areas that they couldn't possibly have been in. So they aren't the most reliable of sources to be working from. Similarly, versions of the same portrait pattern show details in the clothing that others don't. For example, in the so-called Hever Rose portrait at Hever Castle, we can see a very fine gold chain across Anne Boleyn's head, which looks to me to be securing the, the hood in place in place of a chin strap. Now, the fact that these appear in only a few portraits and not in all of them suggests to me that they have been drawn from the same source, but there are inconsistencies and omissions between these copied portraits. Now, another consideration to make, for example, is that we rarely get to see women's shoes in portraits. They are necessarily hidden by the length of the gown, and when we see a full-length portrait of aristocratic women, we necessarily don't get to see their shoes, really frustratingly. And they also aren't always particularly 
well described in inventories either. For example, Catherine Parr was a prolific purchaser of shoes. We have really good inventories which tell us how much money she is spending, but we only really get a, a sense of these shoes function. We don't get good descriptions of them, which is really quite frustrating. So we don't actually necessarily know what they look like. So we really can't use portraiture in isolation for these reasons. If we are going to study clothing of the past, we must couple uh, the analysis of paintings and portraits with evidence gleaned from documents, inventories, wills, but also by studying survival, if only partial, fragmentary or complete garments. So portraits can tell us a lot, and I'm passionate about them, but they must be used in conjunction with other evidence bases. That's so important. Yeah, and I think a really good example of that as well is is the hood, right? The hood, how it's yes. portrayed in portraits and then how, you know, you see sometimes those sort of recreations and they're really vertical. <laughs> it's just the sort visors, of pointing up yeah. ways. And then when you sometimes see portraits and they're not, I suppose we don't see it too often from the side, then you get a sense yeah. of, oh, it's not up. It's, you know, just round and round. Completely around. So, flat. Yeah. yeah. But yet um, even the portrait of Anne, the famous, famous B-neck yes. portrait, it looks like she's sort of a bit on the vertical side. So totally, you do, totally need to use, and that's why we've ended up with so many films where they're just so funny, the French because yeah. they go directly up. And, you know, <laughs> it is all about perspective. It's because she's at that three-quarter um, start yes. that, I mean, a French hood was quite literally a coif and then a crepine sort of attached either to the coif or the hood itself. And the hood was quite literally a flat hood yeah. that was placed, that completely covered the, the coif, leaving the sort of cloth of gold crepine, to, you know, on view. And then part of that hood was folded back. Um, that is how that crescent shape is formed. It's not this solid structure advanced that, <laughs> yeah actually I, I mean we've just watched together the film lady jane from 1986 and just before the crown is placed on jane gray's head her headdress is effortlessly taken off uh, in one rigid structure that is not how they were at all in fact the the linen coif would quite often be held on uh, either by a pin under the chin or tied Actually, we have quite good visual evidence, um, which I'll talk about later, of double chin straps being worn as well. And the hood would quite literally be pinned onto the coif. So, <laughs> you know, these can't be removed effortlessly like that. They were designed to stay in place. Yeah. And um, so, yes, I think we get a very, very skewed idea of what these things were from, from film, actually. Now, oh, and I have one last question for you because I know how you love portraiture, same as, you know, I'm exactly the same as you. So can you tell us about maybe one or two or a couple of your favourite portraits, but specifically what do they tell us about the clothing that women are wearing at this point? That's such a good question. And I think there are a few portraits, which I adore, that can really help us get a better understanding of how garments were constructed, but also how paintings might skew uh, an idea of how the sitter was at, at the time. One portrait in particular by Hans Holbein, which used to be labelled as Queen Catherine Howard, uh, but which more recently has been identified as Lady Elizabeth Cromwell, sister to Queen Jane Seymour. The original is held in the Toledo Museum, uh, but we do have a 16th century version at Hever Castle. It's one of my favourite portraits to stand in front of and gaze at. And beyond the incredible artisanship, we really get a huge understanding of how clothes of the 1540s that Elizabeth is wearing were constructed. For example, as you were saying, we get a really brilliant visual insight into the construction of Elizabeth's hood, which is quite clearly not a single piece, but constructed in at least three layers. We can see that the coif, the linen undercap, is held onto the head with a chin strap. There then is an oreette, uh, which holds the inner bilaments, which is placed on top. Uh, those are the decorations on the inner sort of strand of the hood. And that oreette is also in this portrait quite clearly secured 
with a chin strap. So there are two chin straps at play here. Then the hood is placed on top and turned back. And this is most likely pinned onto the aureate. And the hood with the outer sort of crescent is also trimmed with bilaments. There's also a veil attached to the hood itself. So yes, rather than this being this fixed stiff item, this clearly tells us this, this garment was constructed in layers that when taken off could be, actually be laid flat for transport and for packing. This is really important. If your French hood or indeed English gable hood, your bonnet and frontlet could be laid flat, then you're going to be able to put it in one of your presses. You're going to be able to put it in one of your trunks for transportation. You aren't going to need a specific rigid case in order to transport your headgear. So actually quite a lot of research has been done recently uh, that does demonstrate that these were constructed in layers that were designed to be taken off and laid flat. They weren't these rigid items. So I, you know, absolutely love gazing at this. These paintings really are giving us a massive challenge to how these on-screen French hoods are hugely, hugely problematic. But another portrait keeping it in the family that absolutely fascinates me is the Hans Holbein sketch and painting of Queen Jane Seymour. And before I go into detail about why I love this from a clothing perspective, the differences between Holbein's sketch and the painting that he created are a very useful indicator of the way that copies of paintings were produced. In the sketch that Holbein made, Jane can be seen wearing a simple single strand of pearls and a large double stoned pendant with a pearl drop on it. Now, when Holbein painted his famous existing surviving portrait, he swapped out that single string of pearls and instead inserted the consort and regnant set of jewels that comprised of a cluster of pearls interspersed with bejeweled gold ouches. This is a really famous necklace and it can be seen in pretty much all of the Queen's consort and Queen's regnant of this era. Presumably it was decided that when it came to paint that the more prestigious jewels were desirable in this formal portrait than those that had actually been worn by Jane when Holbein had sketched her. However, in a 16th century version of that painting at Hever Castle, we can see that the, the artist who created it has drawn inspiration not from Holbein's painting, but from the preparatory sketch, because we can see her wearing a single strand of pearls and not the Queen's jewels. And I think this is a really, really helpful way of understanding how these images were reproduced and also the problems that can be associated with that reproductive system. Another reason that I love this painting is it, that it quite clearly shows that the neckline jewels are attached to Jane's kirtle, whereas in portraits uh, of Queen Catherine of Aragon, we can see often that the neckline jewels are attached to the outer gown. This, I think, tells us that practices shifted or changed, or perhaps even that there was a set way of preparing and decorating clothes between households. While the end result may appear similar, we can see that they aren't always arrived at by the same methods. And another aspect that I'm sure many, many people will have noticed in this famous portrait of Jane Seymour are the pins that are shown uh, in this painting. These garments were essentially held together by ties and by laces, but also by pins. And the placket, uh, the, the piece of material uh, that was pinned onto the front to create a nice smooth um, frontage, you can quite clearly see that Holbein has included each pin that Jane was wearing on that occasion. It's such a lovely little detail. It gives you a little bit of confidence, actually, when you are approaching these portraits from a studying perspective, from looking at it um, from a garment um, perspective. So those are two of my 
absolute favourite portraits. It's probably not um, a coincidence that we have versions of both of them at Hever Castle. But yes, I, I think they really do tell us a lot. They give us windows that maybe inventories wouldn't, but I would still caution the absolute necessity of coupling visual research with that that inventory research as well. I have such an urge now, Owen, to just go and look at all these portraits and look really closely. <laughs> and I'm so glad you mentioned the pins, actually, because we're obviously yes. so accustomed to to zippers and, and buttons and, you know, our clothing not needing to be pinned to us. So <laughs> I think sometimes we forget that lots of those layers did involve hundreds of pins in order to put everything in place hence why so many of them are found in the thames when people are mudlarking and all that kind of thing totally. i actually have a couple of 16th century pins at home that i always look amazing. at amazing so what's amazing about um one of those pins is that it, it's really bent so <sighs> you get the sense that it w- went through a, a material that was quite thick so it's funny yeah, yeah, such yeah. a little item can can bring so much to life and that was a gift from Lara Maiklem, I believe. So yeah, she's a, a oh, mudlarker. So it was a beautiful gesture to send me that something tuned up for me to have. So oh, and this has been such a fascinating discussion. And I am so grateful that you um, agreed to contribute to all things 16th century women. As always, an absolute pleasure chatting with you. You are most welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon.